Hi, and welcome to Mrs. Pam Reads. Today we are continuing in our story, Water for Elephants by Sarah Bruin. And we will be in chapter 14 today. In chapter 13, basically Jacob was um, back in his mind, his thought process. He was back in reality. Um, back in the nursing home and you know just kind of telling us about life there he had dinner at the table he didn't really he used to sit at but didn't want to sit at anymore and everything was fine um, but now we're in chapter 14 and we are back reminiscing about the circus it's been six days since Marlena's accident, and she has yet to reappear. August no longer comes to the cookhouse for meals, so I sit conspicuously alone at our table. When I run across him in the course of looking after the animals, he is polite but distant. For her part, Rosie is carted out through each town in the hippopotamus wagon and then displayed in the menagerie. She has learned to follow August from the elephant car to the menagerie tent. And in return for this, he has stopped beating the hell out of her. Instead, she trudges along beside him and he walks with the bull hook snagged firmly in the flesh behind her front leg. Once in the menagerie, she stands behind her rope happily charming the crowds and accepting candy. Uncle Al hasn't actually said so, but there don't appear to be any immediate plans to attempt another elephant act. As the days pass, I grow more anxious about Marlena. Each time I approach the cookhouse, I hope that I'll find her there. And each time I don't, my heart sinks. It's the end of another long day in some damn city or other. They all look about the same from a railroad siding and the flying squadron is preparing to pull out. I'm lounging on my bedroll reading Othello and Walter is on his cot reading Wordsworth. Queenie is tucked up against him. She lifts her head and growls. Both Walter and I jerk upright. Earl's large, bald head pokes around the edge of the door frame. Doc, he says, looking at me. Hey, Doc. Hi, Earl. What's up? I need your help. Sure. What is it? I say, putting my book down. I shoot a glance at Walter, who has pinned the squirming queenie against his side. She's still grumbling. It's Camel, Earl says in a hushed voice. He's got trouble. What kind of trouble? Foot trouble. They've gone all floppy. He kind of slaps them down. His hands aren't so great, neither. Is he drunk? Not at this particular moment, but it don't make no difference no how. Well, damn, Earl, I say. He's got to see a doctor. Earl's forehead crinkles. Well, yeah, that's why I'm here. Earl, I'm no doctor. You're an animal doctor. It's not the same. I glance at Walter, who is pretending to read. Earl blinks expectantly at me. Look, I say finally, if he's in bad shape, let me talk to August or Uncle Al, and we'll see if we can get a doctor out in Dubuque. They won't get him a doctor. Why not? Earl straightens in righteous indignation. Damn, you don't know nothing at all, do you? If there's something seriously wrong with him, sure they'll throw him off the train is what, says Earl definitively. Now, if he was one of the animals, I pondered this for only a moment before realizing he was right. Okay, I'll arrange for a doctor myself. How? You got money? Well, um, no, I say embarrassed. Does he? If he had any money, do you think he'd be drinking Jake and canned heat? 
Ah, oh, come on, won't you at least have a look? The old feller went out of his way to help you. I know that, Earl. I know that, I say quickly. But I don't know what you expect me to do. You're the doctor. Just have a look. In the distance, a whistle blows. Come on, says Earl. That's the five-minute whistle. We got to move. I follow him to the car <clears throat> that carries the big top. The wedge horses are already in place, and all over the flying squadron men are lifting ramps, climbing aboard, and sliding doors shut. Hey, camel, Earl shouts into the open door. I brought the dock. Jacob? Croaks of croaks a voice from inside. I jump up. It takes me a moment to adjust to the darkness. When I do, I make out Camel's figure in the corner, huddled on a pile of feed sacks. I walk over and kneel down. What's up, Camel? I don't rightly know, Jacob. I woke up a few days ago and my feet was all floppy. Jeez, can't feel them right. Can you walk? bit, but I have to lift my knees real high because my feet are so floppy. His voice drops to a whisper. It ain't just that, though, he says. It's other stuff, too. What other stuff? His eyes grow wide and fearful. Man stuff. I can't feel nothing in front. The train jolts forward slowly, lurching as the coupling's tight. We're pulling off. You got, got to get off now, says Earl, tapping me on the shoulder. He moves to the open door and waves me toward him. Waves me toward him. I'll ride this leg with you, I say. You can't. Why not? Because someone will hear you've been fraternizing with roustabouts and chuck you. Or more likely these guys. Off this thing, he says. Well, damn, Earl, aren't you security? Tell them to get lost. I'm on the main train. This here's Blackie's territory, he says, waving with increasing urgency. Come on. I look into Camel's eyes. They're fearful pleading. I've got to go, I say. I'll catch up with you in Dubuque. You'll be okay. We'll get you a doctor. I ain't got no money. It's okay. We'll find a way. Come on, shouts Earl. I lay a hand on the old man's shoulder. We'll figure something out, okay? Camel's roomy eyes flicker. Okay? He nods, just once. I rise from my haunches and walk to the doorway. Damn, I say, gazing out at the fast-moving scenery. The train picked up speed faster than I thought. And it ain't gonna get any slower says Earl, placing a hand square in the middle of my back and shoving me out the door. What the hell, I shout, flailing my arms like a windmill. I hit the gravel and roll onto my side. There's a thunk as another body hits behind me. See, Earl says, getting up and wiping off his backside. I told you he was bad. I stare in amazement. What? He was looking baffled. Nothing, I say. I get up and brush the dust and gravel from my clothes. Come on, you better get back before anybody sees you up here. Just tell them I was checking out the baggage stock. Oh, good one. Yeah, guess that's why you're the doc and I'm not, huh? My head swivels, but his expression is completely without guile. I give up and start walking toward the main train. What's the matter? Earl calls after me. Why are you shaking your head, Doc? What was that all about? Says Walter as I walk in the door. Nothing, I say. Yeah, right. I was here for most of it. Spill the beans, Doc. I hesitate. It's one of the guys from the Flying Squadron. He's in a bad way. Well, that much was obvious. How did he seem to you? Scared. And quite frankly, I don't blame him. I want to get him to a doctor, but I'm flat broke. And so is he. You won't be for long tomorrow's payday. But what are his symptoms? Loss of feeling in his legs and arms and, well, 
Other stuff too. What other stuff? I glance downward. You know, gosh, S word, <laughs> says Walter. He sits upright. That's what I thought. You don't need a doctor. He's got Jake leg. He's got what? Jake leg, Jake walk, limber leg, whatever. It's all the same. Never heard of it. Someone made a big batch of bad Jake. Put plastic sizers in it or something. It went out all over the country. One bad bottle and you're done for. What do you mean done for? Paralyzed. It can start any time within two weeks of drinking the stuff. I am horrified. How the hell do you know this? He shrugs. It's in the papers. They only just figured out what it was, but there's a lot been affected. Maybe tens of thousands, mostly in the South. We passed through there on a way up to Canada. Maybe that's where he picked up the Jake. I pause before asking my next question. Can they fix it? Nope. They can't do anything at all? I already told you. He's done for. But if you want to waste your money on a doctor to tell you that, be my guest. Black and white fireworks explode across my field of vision. A shifting, shimmering pattern that blanks out everything else. I drop onto my bedroll. Hey, you okay? Says Walter. Whoa, pal, you're looking a little green there. You're not going to throw up, are you? No, I say, my heart pounding. Blood whooshes through my ears. I have just remembered the small bottle of brackish liquid Camel offered me my first day on the show. I'm okay. Thank God. The next day, right after breakfast, Walter and I line up in front of the red ticket wagon along with everyone else. At nine on the nose, the man in the wagon beckons forth the first person a roustabout. Moments later, he stalks off, cursing and spitting on the ground. The next one, another roustabout, also leaves in a fit. The people in the line turn to each other, muttering behind their hands. Uh-oh, says Walter. What's going on? It looks like he's holding back Uncle Al style. What do you mean? Most shows hold back some pay till the end of the season, but when Uncle Al runs out of money, he holds it all back. Damn, I say, as a third man storms off. Two other working men, grim-faced and with hand-rolled cigarettes between their lips, leave the lineup. Why are we bothering then? It only applies to working men, Walter says. Performers and bosses always get paid. I'm neither one of those. Walter regards me for a couple of seconds. No, you're not. I don't actually know what the heck you are, but anyone who sits at the same table as the equestrian director, is not a working man. That much I know. So does this happen often? Yup, says Walter. He's bored, scuffing the ground with his foot. Does he ever make it up to them? Don't think anyone's ever tested that theory. The general wisdom is that if he owes you more than four weeks pay, you better stop showing up on payday. Huh. Why, I say, watching as yet another filthy man stops off in a malice storm of curses. Three other working men leave the line from in front of us. They head back to the train with stooped shoulders. Basically, you don't want Uncle Al to start thinking of you as a financial liability because if he does, you disappear one night. What? You get red lighted? Damn right. That seems a bit extreme. I mean, why not just leave them behind? Because he owes them money. How well do you think that would go over? I'm second in line now behind Lottie. Her blonde hair gleams in the sun, arranged into neat finger curls. The man at the window of the red wagon waves her forward. They chat pleasantly as he peels a few bills off his stack. 
When he hands them to her, she licks her forefinger and counts them. Then she rolls them up and slips them inside the top of her dress. Next, I step forward. Name, says the man without looking up. He's a small bald fellow with a fringe of thin hair and wire rimmed glasses. He stares at the ledger book in front of him. Jacob Jankowski, I say, peering past him. The wagon's interior is lined with carved wood panels and a painted ceiling. There is a desk and a safe at the back and a sink along one wall. On the opposite wall is a map of the United States with colored pins stuck in it. Our route, presumably. The man runs his finger down the ledger. It comes to a stop and then moves to the far right column. Sorry, he says. What do you mean, sorry? He looks up at me, the picture of sincerity. Uncle Al doesn't like anyone to finish the season broke. He always holds back four weeks pay. You'll get it at the end of the season. Next. But I need it now. He fixes his eyes upon me, his, plate, his face implacable. You'll get it at the end of the season. Next. As Walter approaches the open window, I stalk off pausing just long enough to spit in the dust. <laughs> and we are going to stop there. Interesting, interesting. I have no clue what's going to happen next. And I saw the movie, but that was a while ago. So anyway, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. And I will see you for the rest of the chapter next time.